let's call to order the meeting. Does I forget? Do we need to have a motion? To... <laughs> Still. No, you just call it to order. Okay, good. Let's call this meeting to order. <laughs> um, do we need to review Zoom procedures since we're in hybrid mode or? Uh, not, I mean, everybody here knows everything, so we're not going to worry about it for this for this meeting. Okay. Um, all right. Has everyone had a chance to look at the agenda? Um, and would anyone like to make a motion to approve the agenda for tonight? I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Great. Thank you, Father Brian. Brian. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, great. Um next is comments from the chair. I don't have any comments, but I would just like to review since we haven't met for a while. Um what the uh what our next, if you can remind us, Mike, what our next chapters are and when we might have public input meetings on those chapters, that would be great. So on late Friday, I did get community services, public safety, and natural resources from SE Group. So those, the storyboards are ready to go. Um, Evelyn is going to be putting those on our website and she is also wrapping up the implementation strategies for each one of those as well. So my hope is that either I didn't hear from her today, so I'll have to just double check tomorrow morning to see where that's at. Um, but I'm hoping by at least by Wednesday and we already, I already talked to her about starting to push out the, the advertising on those three chapters. So those will be on our next meeting, which I believe is the 23rd. Okay, so we think we have enough time to do a public input meeting on the 23rd? Yeah, there'll be one on the 23rd, and then we'll do another one in October, whatever that comes out as. Okay. Great. Um, and you'll send those out to us so we'll have a chance to review before the 23rd. Yep, I'll send out the link as soon as she's got them online. Great. Okay. Um, I don't have any other comments. Um, okay, so in our next item is general business comment from the public about something not on the agenda. Peter, do you have comments? Uh, <clears throat> well, they'll probably be on the agenda. Um, okay, so you're just here to comment on the, the public comments that we've received so far? Yes. Okay. All right. Oops. Okay, so our next item is review the matrix. Um, so are we able to screen share so that us on Zoom and you in person can all see the matrix? Uh, yeah, I just, I'll have to pull up. I have the PDF pulled up, but I should probably, on my computer, but I should probably just pull up the one off of our drive so we can make comments in it as we go. Mike, is there a Wi-Fi I can join? Uh, should be. There we go. Oh, All right, so um, so this is the full sets of comments, um, and we'll have a bunch of these that are going to start all turning green 
uh, as we're working through and making the changes that we've set out to do. Yellows are the ones telling staff to do something, um, and we just have to get them put in. Um, but on a big picture uh, update where we are at, the first three chapters were historic, arts and culture, and housing. So historic, we have uh, completed the implementation plan. We've done all the updates on it, and we have made almost all the updates on the storyboard. So we're just waiting on making one more uh, one more set of small changes, and then historic will be ready to go for um, the public input. Arts and culture, uh, just we'll get a couple of things from uh, Maria on uh, a couple introduction things, and uh, that storyboard will be ready to go. That implementation plan is ready to go. Um, it's, uh, Evelyn is just making the final changes. That way it gets put in. Um, so what we have, where we're at right now, is the, the rest of the ones we have here are primarily targeting the housing changes until we get down to about, I think, 100, somewhere in that area, where we will enter energy, transportation, and utilities. Um, so on those three chapters, the utilities chapter is uh, almost complete. The, uh, in fact, there are just a few small changes and the implementation plan will be ready and the storyboard didn't have any recommended changes in. So we're gonna go through, I'm, I did a final review, found a couple of small changes. So I'm hoping that within the next week, we have a number of these that are quote, uh, done again. Nothing is done until it's until it's over. But at least we've um, uh, had the public input. We've made changes. We've uh, done a lot of uh, proofing and changing and cleaning them up. And then we're as we get these things wrapped up, we'll send them back out to certain committees where it makes sense. I think transportation is pretty close. I was going to ask you tonight if we do the housing up here. These are the housing recommendations, mostly down here. If we focus on the transportation, um, that would be a little bit more efficient use of time. If we can do the energy, great, but um, transportation would be helpful because energy, we already know from Kate Stevenson that the Energy Committee wants a big overhaul. So I'm kind of working on getting that overhaul going. We also know up here, housing has significant changes to go through. So you guys are going to vote on a lot of stuff. We're going to make a number of changes. Once we have those changes boxed up and we make those changes and everything's done, then again, just like historic, uh, historic tonight is actually looking at the historic chapters that we have finished. Um, and we'll get the arts out. Uh, as soon as we get those last changes, we'll get that out to the arts committee. This obviously will take a little bit of time. Once you guys have made decisions on his, on housing and made decisions on energy, it'll take a little time to rebuild those to get those ready for public input. And at the same time, we're then going to be moving into, at the next meeting, community services, natural resources, and uh, public safety. So again, hopefully we get through those chapters. Everything goes smoothly. We get a bunch of comments. We make a bunch of changes. And then we're on to the, the last three. So that's big picture. I just wanted to kind of give you a big overview of where things are kind of at at this point. And I guess we'll uh, uh, go with, before we jump in, we'll get Peter's comment here. Uh, Mike, I just have a clarifying question. Um, I. The, the, you're showing us the matrix, um, the uh, spreadsheet, but when um, when I clicked on the matrix in the uh, the agenda, it started with line 26. Yes, it starts with line 26 because, and I I have no idea why this is a thing, because in the past we could send large PDFs and 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 large emails and the world didn't care. The internet did not care if I sent a 
15 or an 18 megabyte email. Suddenly with high speed internet and fiber optics and everything running beautifully, uh, now our internet is capped at 10 megabytes. I cannot send you any documents bigger than 10 megabytes or it gets shut down. So I had to trim out all of the yellow, which were decisions that have already been made. So the yellows and greens were all trimmed out simply to make the 14 megabyte file be 10 megabytes so I could actually attach it to a document and email it out. So that's why uh, what's actually attached to the agenda is slightly smaller. It's because it is just just to make it so it actually is allowed to be downloaded through the internet. And I have no idea why they, now, yep. Couldn't you put these in separate files? Like put the housing in one file and the, you know, just make smaller files. Uh, yeah, I mean, as we said, it's it was just attached that way for convenience this time. I didn't know it was going to be an issue until I tried to make the files. So that's kind of the way it is. Uh, we'll try to see if we can get, I was going to work with Evelyn. I'm trying to keep her prioritized on the pieces that we're trying to get out, but eventually we want to get the matrix PDF. And if I put it on the website, on the web page of the city plan with a PDF that's 15, 18, 20 megabytes, you can still download it. I just can't email it and I can't attach it um, to download on the agendas um, because I have a cap on my agenda. So, well, how, but how how could we have how could we have found the complete one with the yellow and starting on line one, et cetera? I would have to make that and put that as a as a separate box. Um, again, I didn't figure this out till Friday as I was putting together the agenda that it wasn't going to let me simply attach that whole file and email it out. So that was why I had to, at the last minute, kind of go and cut it out and, and just shorten it up and really put the matrix in that talks just about the pieces that we're talking about tonight. Okay, thanks. All right, so um, I guess I'll just look off the screen here. So uh, again, just for everybody, uh, the, the B is where comments have been summarized. C have been my comments on pieces. And then D is going to be whatever you guys uh, do. And in, in here is also some pieces of um, comments from other folks, mostly Maria. Um, who has gone through and made some changes. So my hope is we can kind of efficiently work our way through so we can get onto some other items uh, that, that commissioners wanted to talk about. And then also, as I said, be able to try to get through as many of the transportation pieces as we can. I want to be able to start wrapping chapters up and I can't do it till we can get through the matrix. So the first one, uh, these are again, these. so these are talking specifically about the goals. We're still in the goals, not the strategies yet. And goal number four, uh, a comment about being specific and why universally accessible just on the first floor. So this was a, uh, something that had been discussed a great deal by the Planning Commission and had gone back and forth. And this was where the decision had come down to. Um, uh, there was concerns at the time of having a goal of universal accessibility to all spaces would act as a barrier to housing development. So that's why, and again, this is just where the Planning Commission at the time fell after conver having a conversation about universal accessibility. And you guys are welcome to, to change it, keep it. or I can just move on to the next one and we can leave it as it is. If, yeah, if nobody feels very strongly about it, I think we should just keep it as first floor. I think that makes a lot of sense not to put too many barriers to housing development at this point in time. Yeah, I agree. And I agree with Maria's comment. All right, Peter. Well, this was my objection. I think if you you would not be uh, making it less 
useful if you said increase the number of dwelling units that meet appropriate requirements of universal accessibility. It doesn't say anything. The, the, my concern was by saying first floor, it sounds like that's specifically where you want it. I think it should be, in this case, a little bit vaguer or a little bit more general. Appropriate requirements. First floor just seems very specific. Well, the goal was, at, as I said, this is what the Planning Commission had kind of talked about and bandied about, and their their interest was in first floor is where it's the easiest to be able to make universal accessibility. So if we focus on getting the first floors universally accessible, which they currently are not, we would be making a big strides in making the housing stock and everything else more universally accessible. Um, I would just like I'd just like to point out that right now, because there are not elevators in anywhere in Montpelier, that's created a serious accessibility problem for a lot of people. I think that talking about first floor only is a mistake, which is going to bite you. My concern about all of this is things are changing and they're changing fast, and and so you need to have statements that leave room for that aren't going to look silly in a couple of years. It's going to look silly in a couple of years to see first floor specified. I think you need to be more general here. I understand why the, the committee decided this four years ago or six years ago, whenever it was decided. But now it's already, look, around, look at the city without elevators and you see the problem. What's, what's wrong with saying something like what I suggested? Increase the number of dwelling units that meet appropriate requirements of universal accessibility. Because three years from now, I guarantee you that uh, there are going to be lawsuits, ADA lawsuits, if people can't get to the rec center, which they can't get now. If people can't get to the, uh, the theater at the second floor, sorry, the third floor of, the, of City Hall. Well, yeah, a lot of these places are, are simply out because of the elevators having been destroyed in the flood, and they're all I know that's replaced. why. And if universal accessibility generally means putting in more elevators, so. Um, also, this is referring this, to housing. Well, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the public, the public buildings are required. Public yes, public buildings. That that's an issue. There's there's a thing about that later on in a comment uh, on a, on a different. Not on, not housing related. And that absolutely, public buildings need to be universally accessible. Yeah, because they're required to under the ADA. Yeah, I agree with the other counselors that I think first floor for housing would be a good step. And I like that it's kind of specific instead of appropriate requirements. So, all right. So we will leave this one as is. Uh, goal number five, uh, somewhat vague meant uh, what is meant by areas where um, needs are not currently met. So I don't have the the full written piece in front of me. And I think this one was meant to be vague because uh, I think this this was talking about barriers to access, um, to access housing. So those barriers, why is it intentionally vague? Because there's a lot of things, incarceration, substance abuse, affordability, domestic violence, physical disabilities, and others. If we tried to list them all, then we will undoubtedly miss some. So our goal is to commit to further fair housing uh, focuses on all areas where these needs are not met. That's why it's written vague is because we're just, we're going to, if anyone brings out points where we aren't furthering fair housing, then that's, that's why that one is vague. And I think that one should be left as is. I agree, and I, I agree with Maria's comment here, which basically says that. Okay, so goal six, uh, grammatically confusing. Um, is it development of housing that is not provided by the private market? If so, should be is, not are. What does support mean in this statement? Financial, logistical and what sort of partners are to be supported. The goal statement, in fact, intended to mean increased support for nonprofit development partners like Downstreet, 
as opposed to for-profit developers like the Connor brothers? If so, I don't really understand why such support wouldn't be provided to anyone who wishes to develop housing in Montpelier, including homeowners. I suggest revisiting the writing of this goal to make the intent clear. Uh, and the Planning Commission can consider revisiting this to make it clear um, it was meant to support our nonprofit housing partners, but we certainly can expand it as Peter has suggested in, in the wording of this one here to, because I believe it was written with the intention of talking about, um, it was framed around the housing trust fund and most of the housing trust fund was really focusing at the time on supporting our housing partners they would be the ones to provide the you know whether it was adu assistance or building new units and so this was meant framed like that but we can certainly go and talk about changing or expanding it and i might have to actually pull it up so we can know exactly what it says so I'll let you guys talk about it while I, oh, I can't because I'll take it off the screen. Yeah, I can do it while we're talking. All right, so it's wording right now is increased support for partners in the development of housing that are not provided by the private market. Anyone have a better way of thinking of wording it if or leaving it as is? So I think one, the comment is getting to whether partners should only be nonprofits or whether they should be allowed to be developers or future homeowners. Um, I mean, I think there is a role in government to kind of bridge gaps between maybe what banks are willing to fund and what the private market can withstand. Um, and it's definitely done in, I, sorry, I keep going back to USDOT, but that's, done, <laughs> that's done in, you know, rail transit where there's situations where government is funding things that there is no private market yeah, for. That's why there's Amtrak. That's why there's Amtrak. Well, actually, Amtrak is partially private. Part yeah. yeah, it's that's... okay. It's okay. We get it. But yeah, um, but there are plenty of, you know, loan programs and other programs that are meant to kind of fill that gap. I think here, though, we are specifically talking about nonprofit partners. Would this? Do you think the city would have? Do you think the city could stomach giving better terms to a private uh, development company, giving them better terms than just like any other developer coming off the street? That, yeah, it requires like picking and choosing which developers you're going to support. Or if it's a nonprofit, then you already kind of know who you're working with. Know yeah, it's also are. interesting um, the, going back to the term support because we do now have conversations about having development agreements which are with private partners. Um, so they're not nonprofits that are getting the benefits of development agreements. Okay. So... Support can be broader. Like as we said at the time, we were this was originally drafted. It was really coming out of the housing trust fund. We've got we're raising money, um, and we're not going to just give our tax dollars to for profit developers so they can make more money. We're giving right. it to nonprofits so they can provide housing that the market otherwise couldn't provide, and that could be as has been done to. Um, Good Samaritan Haven for homeless shelter or for uh, another organization, I don't know their name, who does the refugee housing. Um, so these are, the market doesn't provide for those types. So we're going to go in. But now there is, there are, there are also benefits for, with through these other programs, like the development agreements to also provide benefit to for profit, to, to for profit businesses so so then partners in this case is private as well as nonprofits so we could think about the yeah we could think about keeping the wording the same and just think think about it broader i know i kind of like actually this makes me lean towards just using partners because <laughs> <laughs> it encompasses nonprofits as well as private partners that you're discussing
So yeah. Peter wants to give a quick comment. Yeah, I mean, my actual purpose of this was to include property owners. And so I, that's why I don't think you should be specifying who the partners are. Um, it, and I have to correct you, Mike, because part of the uh, trust fund was first time buyer program, which was for, uh, you know, uh, ordinary people. Uh, and and if, if infill is going to be done and people are going to be duplexing, these are individual property owners. So again, here, I think it, it would make sense to not be so specific. How is because that now, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it says increased support for partners in the development of housing that are not provided by the private market. And I, I'm me reading that, I do understand that I would say that, oh, yes, they're talking about downstream. But uh, I, I understand, I, th I think I understand what Peter is saying that if somebody was, say, uh, if the city was to come up with maybe a, a, a program that to encourage ADUs and use the housing fund to say, oh, any property owners who put in an ADU can get a X dollar amount towards it. So what if we tried to just qualify the partners? We could either switch the word partners to something different, or we could qualify it to go through and say for our for-profit and non-profit mm -hmm. partners and actually just put that right in there so that way it's clear that we're talking about providing support for both or we can find a different word for partner that doesn't have the i'll just badly use the word baggage that comes along you know people are going to think as we said you read partners you think it's a narrower group than we are intending we're now talking about not being an arrow group, but a more broad group. So maybe if we just put the qualifier in, that would clear clear that up. But for-profit partner doesn't sound like a homeowner. That, I mean, I guess it is a for-profit. That's not where my mind immediately goes. <laughs> if I hear a, like a for-profit partner. But how about someone who just wants to build a house? Yeah, I don't know how like many not, people are going to be really thrilled about I don't know. Growing the, yeah. The, the, well, what about ADUs and and duplexing? That that those are individual uh, property owners. There is a state program for ADU, and we oh. yeah, and we support that through our um, because it's got a limited amount of money. So we actually we are working through Downstreet to it's called VHIP, and we're working through Downstreet. And if Downstreet runs out of money from VHIP, then we can shift our housing trust fund money to basically fund the same program that VHIP is. Okay. Might need to think about the wording on this one for a little bit. Unless but, somebody has a stroke of genius right now. But we may be able to get away with just having some qualifier and I can go through and finish word profing it or word smithing it to get in that that really addresses homeowners or profit developers and non profit partners something to that effect if we added something that kind of addressed it homeowners for profit developers and non profit partners into that sentence I think it would capture most, yeah. or is it yeah. just capture too many? What was that, Brian? I said it seemed that's that would seem to catch most of it, of what between the uh, Peter's comments and what the the commission is saying. That's the three categories that would, would cover. I mean, I just this is maybe too fine a point, but I think do we we mean home buyers, right? Yeah. Not. No. Oh. No, or do we sure. mean homeowners who are adding ADUs or homeowners who need rehab funds? I guess now I'm getting a little confused. Yeah, this, is, 
this was getting into, I think, increasing the amount of housing because we're talking about doing housing development. Yeah, I mean, to me, if it's a homeowner, the, the home buyer under, doesn't quite fall in. Okay, well then, I think we should just say for-profit developers and nonprofit partners. I mean, I think a homeowner who's developing a single unit could be considered a developer. I mean, to me, that's confusing to say homeowners because. I don't know, <laughs> but that's just, but maybe other people don't find it confusing. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't, I don't think there are any funds for this available yet, but you think of um, some of the adjustments that were made in the last zoning uh, and, and then the city council talking about six units anywhere where there's um, city water and sewer. And we know we have some really large homes that potentially, could, you know, it's, you're not just talking about, you're talking about co- what do we call it, Mike? It's not co co living. We call it something else here. Um, yeah, there's co housing and there's a couple other pieces. Congregate living, single room, and congregate living. Yeah, congregate living. Right. Like again, I don't think there's a lot of money for that in the moment, but when we want to support people who are looking at congregate living situations, so I, you know, I don't know. I'm okay with homeowners being in there. Or we could just take out the for-profit. I mean, if it was homeowners, developers, and nonprofit partners, then I think we've kind of captured. A lot of the players that we're talking about. And I think that would clean up a lot of it. And I think there's a grammatical question. I think there was an agreement or consent that said it should be Uh, change to is we'll go through. We're as I said, Evelyn and I are going through, and we're doing final proofreading on everything, and so we'll try to catch those as well. But all right, that was that one good. Now we jump into the various strategies, and again, let's we'll see if we can kind of get through these. Um, uh, Country Club Road being the most important strategy. It's treated the same. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, So yeah, we're going to be going through and making some changes to to update the CCR language. And again, we're not looking to make these. We've talked about this a little bit. Each one of these strategy descriptions isn't meant to be a comprehensive summary of the entire thing. It's really meant to be relatively um, short and straightforward. Um. So that's why it's not fully in there. With all the all the details. The, the reason no, listen, this is my comment. The reason I made it is not because I wanted the details to be right. I think there should be fewer details. This is a moving target. Describe the importance of country club road without going into the numbers because the numbers are going to change we don't know what's actually going to end up being there i mean my my jet most of my comments are about this whether or not you're being too specific because this is going to be written in stone this is supposed to be for eight years back back away from it a little bit be talk about the core value of this, which is great. Yeah, I'd have to pull up the specifics on that one, but we are going to, I will rewrite these. So we are going to go through and, and have these re-edited. So. But Mike, I'm just suggesting that in rewriting them, 
try to get to the essence, the core, the import of a strategy without without mentioning a whole bunch of specifics. Because when I went through this three years ago, two years ago, and most recently, every time there were things that were changed, which of course there's going to be. So why this is going to look silly in five years, all this detail. Well, some of it's going to have to, some of it is going to be dated. We're going to end up with strategies that say we should adopt the policy. And then two years from now, it might be adopted. And that doesn't make it wrong that somebody four years from now is looking back and saying they wrote that strategy to to do something that's already been done. It's like, well, we're going to have those. Um, so, but I think we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we work our way through these um, to try to, to to try to give enough so people understand the direction. What are the steps that are involved that we're going to be doing, knowing that somebody may look at it in two years and some of the steps have already been completed. And Mike, I think you've said before that our hope with the city plan is that we will be updating it more frequently than maybe it's been done in the past. Yeah, we would yeah, that's my hope is that we'd have the ability to kind of go through and and do a little bit more. Well, that's what, and that's what I was thinking too. What Maria, what you said is that there would be more like real time. I mean, there has to be a snapshot in time, at some point. Yeah. And then it's not static because then the the commission, when we're into the new period of eight years, is actively working on on the plan for the next update. Right, the planning commission has work to do in the interim to update those things. So that was the once we get this is kind of the reset with this new format and everything. And then once it's reset there's kind of the ongoing real-time updating that will happen in on a, on a regular basis, continuous basis. We'll get another iteration and kind of take it from there. Um, so there's a lot in this one. So my comments were this has been adjusted due to recent changes. The council just adopted a development agreement policy. So this has already changed. It's not the utility and infrastructure incentive program. It's now the development agreement policy, which lays out how an, incent an infrastructure incentive program would work. Funds still depend on how much is needed to support the, pro the project. Sometimes it's relatively small amount. Sometimes it's a lot. Um, it mostly apply to medium and large site large projects. Payback is through utility fees, for example, or property taxes. Um, so Country Club Road is slightly different. That one's going to probably run on a TIF, but it's the same idea. Habitat, Northfield Street, need extensions to the site. Isabel Circle needs extensions into the site with new roadways. Economic development projects like Caledonia Spirits replaced and moved a water line in Berry Street. Sabin's Pasture is an old neighborhood and needs utilities. Crestview is off old neighborhoods and requires utilities if that project is ever to be revived. So um, I think we'll get the updated version. Um, and so we can do it that same staff will update in next iteration. So I think that's the best we'll do for that one for now. Um, Right now we have some requirements, so. Um, All right, the third one, uh, neighborhood development areas. Um, why is it listed if we don't currently participate? Well, it was a proposal that we do participate. Um, and I think some of this goes back to there were some conversations about making sure we had our verbs in the right place. I think those were those have been addressed and are being addressed in the next iteration. So all the titles are now talking about adopt a new neighborhood development area. In this case, we're probably not going to do an NDA and that's neighborhood development area. Um, and so we'll have to just see what ends up coming out of that um, because 
right now we're trying to get everybody into a growth center rather than the neighborhood development area. So if we get the growth center expansion, then that makes neighborhood NDAs moot. So we'll have to see. Um, that was my point. Why include it, particularly as an important strategy, if we're not doing it? So if it turns out we're not doing it, it should be taken out. Yeah, it will. And like we said, it was it it was it wasn't removed until a very very recently. I mean, up until Act One Eighty One was passed, there were still people coming in. Habitat was asking to be added in as an NDA. Um, a couple other places had been coming in asking to be added as as a neighborhood development area and not the growth center. Uh, it was only with Act One Eighty One that we made the the staff decision and took it to city council to change that to to apply for growth center rather than uh, NDA because it had more power. Uh, so I think we've already adjusted the commonly referred to language out of it. It hasn't been published yet, but Mer um, we've already changed that one. Um, described as protecting and promoting health, safety, and welfare. It's actually, that is actually exactly why under the U.S. Constitution in 1926, uh, it's one of these cases that all of us professional planners have to study. Uh, it is the case that Euclid versus Ambler, which is where zoning is actually enabled under the U.S. Constitution. And it is allowed under the U.S. Constitution because it is a police power that protects the health, safety, and welfare of the community. So that's why... Um, But so I, I think most of that is OK. Agree that some of these can be rewritten and worded better to convey the intent. Uh, we are working. That is something I'm asking Evelyn to read and proof um, to go through and kind of uh, reword these. So she has no background in planning. She has no background in any of this. So she is really kind of reading things with uh, fresh eyes to make sure they make sense. Um, a lot of these were built over time. So we would have, we would sit down with say the housing committee and they would give us five changes that we should do. And all of them involve unified development regulations. So we had five recommendations and then we would go back in and collapse them into one because they all involved zoning. And so it tend, tended to just grab them and move chunk for chunk five pieces and put them together. So we now have to kind of rewrite, rewrite them to make sure that the intent and the policy and everything is kind of written cleaner. And that's what Evelyn is working on right now. So what do we have? Yes, Peter. Uh, no, I, I, Mike, uh, again, this was my comment here. It was not that I didn't think that uh, health uh, and welfare were included, but let's be honest. If you look at the last big changes that were made to the uh, regulations, it was a technical change to try to make sure that they, that they were not, I can't even remember the percentage, you probably can tell me, uh, properties that were out of compliance. You were trying to get, you know, a, a fairer system. So I, I, I think to, to character, I don't, it's fine to mention health and welfare, but that's not the main thing that zoning does. The main, what, what is the main thing that zoning does? Unfortunately, as in the recent article that I uh, sent around, one of the main things that zoning has been has done in Montpelier and around the country is to be exclusionary, right? Now, I'm not suggesting we, sit, we we brag about that, but I think we need to kind of, well, one thing I would say, what are we going to do about this in the, going forward? We're going to make it less exclusionary. We're going to, we're going to promote uh, um, a, a broad variety of, of housing, et cetera. What, that would be an aspiration for the unified regulations is to open up what has been closed down over the last 50 years 
by keeping us a cute little town. Well, I, I don't think we need to get into that whole debate now because I could, if, if you understood zoning throughout the country, you would understand how vastly different our zoning is um, than most of the other places, um, you know, places that pat themselves on the back like Minneapolis because they've opened up their zoning. They literally said the only use that is allowed for 80% of their community is a single family detached house. You, it was, it was patently illegal. You know, we haven't had that in, in our community to go and have it that strictly tightened down in parts of Burlington only allowed single family dwellings. We have never had that. Um, we, we don't have rules that had limited things to only single family dwellings. Now, people could disagree that they thought the density should be different. And we we did a, we did do a lot to make technical changes to help to, to clean those up. But um, but I, I I don't think I think you need to look at some other communities and see and compare them to ours to see just how flexible and open our zoning currently is. It's the economics that are holding us back right now. Um, but we'll continue to, to make changes as we see things that are barriers. We'll continue to review them to see if if they support a an overall safety. Obviously, we wouldn't want to go through and say, eliminate uh, building on steep slopes or uh, building in the floodplains to increase housing. We'd, we'd want to still have those requirements in there. Um, uh, comment on abandoning the process. I mean, I obviously don't think we're going to be abandoning the process on this one. Anyone's welcome to jump in. Uh, proofreading, yes, we are doing that. We are in the process of doing that. Uh, these guys have been done without citing evidence. Most of this isn't intended to, to have the links back to source data. It's, it's meant to be, um, With some with some exceptions within the storyboards, we've been talking about adding in some where the data sources come from within within those because people have asked, you know, I have a solar panel, why, is, why isn't it on the map? So we're trying to get that data because I think it would be helpful to understand. But I don't think we're trying to turn this into a, um, a, a publication with all the footnotes and references that go through and say, well, that's why, you know, that's where this number comes from. We're, we're um, not trying to turn it into that type of document. We're trying to have it more accessible. Um, yeah, I think my comment here is that this isn't a legal filing or academic paper that needs citations. Oh, yes. Sorry, I haven't been looking at your comments, but yes. Peter, you have a comment? Uh, just two quick comments. Um, the first one is that, again, my concern is with, with, with the, um, the um, what do you call it? The, what's it called? The, 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 the interactive thing. Those storyboard, storyboard. Storyboard, the storyboard. A lot of the stuff that is in the story, this storyboard is already out of date. So either you're going to commit yourself to constantly be revising that, or you shouldn't put in stuff like the, the, some of those numbers. I, I, I don't think it's a, an academic uh, uh, paper. I, w I wasn't asking for, for citations. I was just saying, I, I, when I read you, know, we have, you know, the averaging, you know, uh, price is this and the, you know, average number of, 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 uh, single family homes that is all of the, a lot of that stuff is changing why put in something that you're going to have to update you mentioned a whole bunch of times that evelyn and you were going to do this and evelyn you were going to do this does evelyn work only for you no she's got lots of other responsibilities i mean the fact that that i mean 
this should go through a professional proofreader, a professional copy editor, and you should try to have, and I'll tell you, a professional copy editor would make some of the same kind of the criticism I'm saying, why are you being so specific here? You're not going to have the time to keep this up to date. You don't you, already. What's up there is out of date. I mean, you, you, you still haven't linked the storyboards to, to the uh, strategies, which you said a month ago was going to happen. You don't have the time. Evelyn doesn't have the time. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of time, Peter, I just I want to get through this and I appreciate your right. comment and you've right. submitted it before. But I, I do think that we've heard this comment and I personally feel like it's useful to have numbers and we're going to be updating it. We talked about how we're going to be updating it and we are going to do some proofreading. So I'd like to move on. All right, I'm going to be quiet. I'll be I'll be quiet and go away, but I think you're making a big mistake. Yeah, I'm not asking you to be quiet or go away, but I just I feel like this comment we have we have worked through before. That's my personal feeling, but I welcome other commissioners' thoughts. Clarity and next iteration can capture some of these. Um, so yeah, on unified development regulations, um, some of the typos, some of the things are being cleared up. Um, this is an, an actionable strategy. So, uh, so the plan when it comes to strategies, we weren't just intending to talk about things that. You know, we we intend to talk about things that we we do and are going to continue to do. And if something's going well, um, you don't necessarily have to make changes. Keep doing what you're doing is to to keep doing what you're doing is an actionable plan. Um, and I think that's it's important for the the public for people to know. Um, people can disagree whether it's it's doing well or not, but we wanted to make sure we had in there. Uh, including the existing things we do, whether it's unified development regulations or other things. Um, so unless somebody's going to jump in, just move uh, additional barriers. Oh, this is still about unified development regulations. Um, current zoning are weak on health and safety because they don't address rental issues such as evictions, health and safety violations, tenant complaints, landlord, tenant interactions, questions about whether there's evidence of removing parking requirements makes a difference in creating more housing, want zoning administrator and DRB to have more flexibility. So most of the recommendations to remove um, additional barriers have already been completed. I think we've talked about that a couple of times. Um, a lot of these other ones are not items that the unified development regulations or zoning can or do adjust that you'd have to have a different set of things. Zoning doesn't do evictions, doesn't do health and safety violations of, of these types, tenant complaints. You wouldn't want them to because um, just zoning, zoning has its own unique statutory requirements and therefore anything that exists is allowed to continue into the future indefinitely. So if you have something that's a violation of health under zoning, you can continue to violate the health. Um, that's why you do different ordinances. You don't put those types of issues, landlord tenant issues. You have a rental ordinance that is outside of zoning. So, um, so, uh, and then the, the question of flexibility, zoning administrators must enforce rules. Literally do not have the authority to make decisions subjectively. We have written these rules to have broad administrative authority and flexibility as vested in the DRB. So if property owners choose not to take advantage of the flexibility by taking their application to a DRB, then that's on them. Uh, the DRB process adds 30 days uh, to the process, but if somebody wants to get a waiver from a rule, then that's the way the process works. Um, there's not really much to change there. Again, we're going to be going through and, and rewording it, but there's no real change here unless somebody wants to suggest something. Uh, restated. Yeah, most of these are above. Um, I talked about those. 
advocacy and comments to make sure payback is valid that should require affordable housing. Um, oh, this is the utility. Uh, that's an option. So requiring affordable housing in these, a lot of these currently are trying to make housing that's not um, marketable to make them marketable. Uh, so it, it's up to the council or up to the board if we want to add that as a requirement. So if you were to get a development agreement, go and say, we're going to help put in the water lines, the water users of that new development are going to be paying water bills. Those water, the water they're money they're paying to the water bills are going to go to pay the bond that put the water line in basically. So now the developer doesn't have to pay for the water line or paying for it. And we've got the formulas to make sure that it actually pays for itself. Um, we could, we being city council could require those buildings have affordability or have a percentage of affordability. They haven't, um, that would be up to this board to recommend adding that in or not. Well, I'll just speak to this as I think it's just a, it's a challenging idea. I know Burlington's been able to do it. If you talk to some developers in Burlington, they basically, it's, it is so, Vermont has so few people that can be compliant with the, all the LIHTC rules that it basically are, are those agencies that we know of, right? It's the, the down streets and their equivalents and other, other parts of the state. There's a couple for-profit people that have been able to do it. Um, if you look at uh, Farrell's project, the old, um, I think it was a Catholic orphanage, uh, Cambria Rise. He, he, so Burlington required it, but he basically just had to give a bunch of land away because he, he couldn't figure out how to do it. And from a developer perspective, while everybody would love to work with Downstreet, um, they're booked out multiple years in advance in terms of the projects they have. And there's only so many credits available each year that each state gets. And, you know, there's, it's like, it's not like there's just an infinite amount of affordable housing credits that you can get. And so if you made this a requirement here, you likely would keep yourself from being able to do partnerships with for-profit developers. I would not recommend it. All right, we already talked about this one. NDA is being removed. TIFF wants back. Uh, want an explanation of TIFF somewhere in the document. Um, so I think the best would, I think we have down here, we could consider a link to explain TIFF, but the format here is to be brief. I don't think we have enough time. Um, I could give a one hour discussion and example of how TIFF works. Uh, we have tried to explain this to legislators and auditors and the public and everybody and TIFF is a very complicated idea. So uh, I don't think there is a brief explanation that could fit in this document. But if we had a link to it somewhere, we could always try to add in a link. I don't know of one though. My comment here is that I thought the first sentence actually did a very good job explaining okay. <laughs> basically <laughs> the idea behind TIFF. Um, it was, I think it was concisely written. An inclusion stating rarely used for housing. Um, so uh, tax stabilization. Um, is rarely used for housing. Um, and it's not that it's not good for taxpayers. Again, um, used for commercial pro uh, projects um, under Vermont law. So just everybody is aware, we're Dillon's rural state. We can only do what the legislature gives us the power to do. And tax stabilizations can only be used on commercial projects. So that's why they're not, that's why they're rarely used for housing. It's because in their infinite wisdom, the legislature said you can't. So we um, generously rewrote ours to go through and say, well, we think residential commercial 
it's a classification of five units or more is generally sometimes classified under the tax system, tax code as residential commercial. So we said, well, residential commercial is commercial. So we allow it for buildings of five units or more. So we can't do it if somebody's developing a quadplex. We can't do it if somebody's building a single family home, even if it's affordable, um, because state law won't let us. We do allow it for residential commercials. Um, but it can't be combined with development agreements and things like TIF because TIF requires that. It needs that income to pay for the bond. So you can't have a tax stabilization and a TIF because they would cancel each other out. Um, so usually, and usually it's a better deal for people to get a development agreement than it is to get the the TIF or to, to get the, the tax stabilization. So uh, I think there must've been comments in it about Green Mountain Coffees and these other places. Um, I don't think those were tax stabilizations. I believe those were VITA incentives, which are different, Vermont Economic Development. Um, so, but in any event, uh, I think the tax stabilization is fine. We do need to revise it. There's a lot of things. Um, Josh has done this in other communities. There are a lot of things we could do. It'll take a vote to go and be able to make adjustments to it. But um, so that should be hopefully good. Um, I might make some edits, ADU, um, number of suggestions. So the great deal of interest, we could, you're welcome to go through and make edits, uh, if you choose, um, the, when we did the Mad Up program, the reason why I said there was a great deal of interest was when we did the opening thing for the Mad Up program, um, the initial interest in this program generated 50 homeowners who came out and said they were interested. We only had six. We were only, we only going to be do, doing six, and we had 50 people interested. We had to choose between the 50 of them to see who would be able to do it. Um, so we kind of always considered that to be a great deal of interest in putting in ADUs, and it wasn't. we didn't consider that to be an exaggeration. But if people don't want that in there, we're welcome to pull it out. Um, the HUD restrictions made it very hard for us to use the money. We only ended up doing seven. Good idea, bad funding mechanism. None of this is really relevant to the new continued program, which is why it's not discussed here. The city council gave approval to the housing commission version of the ADU through Downstreet. So, um, I still think there's a great deal of interest in these, which is why the state money keeps getting sucked up so fast. But welcome to leave it or change it. Yeah, I think leaving it as it is is fine. All right, other comments. Uh, I believe this should be extended to other housing projects like rentals, condos, subdivisions. Uh, it could, but it would have to be a different committee. Could housing committee could con could consider, it, but it would be a different program. Um, just by the way the the program was set up and discussed. Um, designated downtown. Why list on page one with high priorities? Okay, we already fixed those. Um, and yes, the benefits apply to any public building, which includes rental housing. So, uh, if you, so why do we talk about designated downtowns with housing, uh, designated downtown is a big program. It has a lot of benefits. If you have a, a historic rental building in the downtown, you could use, because we're in the designated downtown, you can get tax credits to fix that building up. Because we have a designated downtown, you are now exempt from Act 250. Um, because we have a designated downtown. So yes, uh, designated downtown does have a lot of, of uh, and that's why we wanted to put these things in so people could start to understand um, what we do kind of makes um, makes a difference um, in, in lots of different ways. So I would just leave this, might not be on page one, We'll get it. That's why it's there. Why is it a low priority? Why on page one? Well, we already fixed the low priority piece. Um, and why is it a low priority? Uh, it's just a low priority because um, everybody was we had to decide which ones. Everything couldn't be a high priority. 
And with everything that was on the table, that was the outreach program that the planning commission decided to have as the low priority. And I'm fine leaving it there. I'm fine changing it. Um, but in a prioritized plan, everything can't be a high priority. And we will review wording for clarity with Evelyn. Um, recommend different program focused on helping seniors and homeowners with developing their own properties. Oop. All right. Uh, that would need to be a recommendation from the housing committee. There are risks and pitfalls for the city need to be considered. We're not developers and recommending people do projects that don't work out. I generally recommend finding partners to the work. Capstone Downstreet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's usually what, what it is. I mean, so having programs to help seniors and homeowners develop their own properties is, is a good idea, but we would need to have a partner that comes up with the program that says this is how it's going to happen. Uh, comment that code enforcement does not include rental inspections. Uh, city does not run down people who fail to pull permits, fail to address egregious code violations like Brown Derby, want tenant bills of rights and just evictions. Why want rental housing survey removed? Um, so... Uh, this was a comment on the code enforcement. And so broadly, none of these are real code enforcement issues, which is why they're not discussed here. Um, that Those would require a rental registry program, which the city council has rejected on a number of occasions. It would require many more staff to fulfill the requirement, which would be charged back to the renters. The Brown Derby was, was removed by adopting a new ordinance because the code enforcement piece on its own was not sufficient to address those types of issues. Code enforcement makes sure that new and renovated projects are up to code, which is about health and safety, tenant bills of rights, and just cause evictions are not part of NFPA, IBC, IRC, electrical, plumbing, or any of the other state adopted codes. Those would be separate strategies that would be discussed and added by the housing committee. So not to say those other things could not be added, but they're not code enforcement issues. Uh... public-private partnerships for housing. So uh, this is another um, strategy. So how these projects happen is through these things. Um, we're not gonna get into a big argument about this. Uh, they These were projects that, properties that sat vacant for decades, yes, but French Block was a project that started in 2016 and we built it in about three years. Taylor Street started in about 2017. Um, before that, each one of those had been tried to be private projects and they were intended to be private projects until the private developers pulled out and left them to the city. So the city made these public-private partnerships with the nonprofits to make them happen, so. Uh, this is recommended to be combined with the utility infrastructure program. So yeah, I think this is going to be part of the development agreements because most of these actually tie into the development agreement. Um, So that uh, may be combined in next iteration. Automatic sprinkler suggests this is not an actionable item and should be removed. As we said, continuing to do items um, 
is still an actionable item in in my view. It's a strategic plan. How do we accomplish our safety goals by having this program? Um, or in this case, having this requirement. Um, people can agree or disagree with the requirement, but there's a reason it was put in there. It goes beyond the minimum fire codes to require sprinklers in more residential buildings for safety reasons. Um, and it's a regulatory requirement to ensure safe housing. So that's why it's there. The counterpoint to that, that was adopted at the same time was the sprinkler incentive program, which was simply to go through and offer benefits to people. If you were to put in a sprinkler, then you would get a 10% discount on your property taxes. So um, again, uh, there's nothing that we need to do. It's just to continue to do this program. So um, we've discussed how these work and that we 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 want to discuss continuing programs, um, even if they don't need amendments, we want to talk about them. So we have the full array of all the tools that we are using to achieve our goals, in this case, safety. Growth center, uh, high priority in page two, we already fixed that. Uh, so yeah, we're still working on that. looking to expand the, to include those. And the map of the growth center program is a part of the storyboard. So I think, I think the growth center one is pretty good. Again, we will, we'll reword it when we do our, our rewording part, but I think it's, I think the implementation plans when you get to see them are going to be in much better shape than they were through the first iteration. Uh, typo on French's high priority on page two, not actionable, only one word. Suggest we should refer to many years ago, the city worked with housing partners, list housing projects done over the past 30 or 40 years. Want to fact check every year money set aside for housing projects. So no, in fact, it is French's. That is not a typo. And uh, I only know that because that's actually what is stamped on the outside of the building. So if you don't believe me, you can Google Drive it and take a look at it. It is French's. Uh, high priority has already been fixed. Commission voted on on the one project goal. Disagree with the many years ago. Worked on Taylor Street, French's, Good Samaritan Haven. Um, continually working on projects. Uh, That's more just arguing points. Um, Uh, was not aware of any year zeroed out. Well, I think this year it's actually zeroed out. So this year might be the first year that it was actually zeroed out um, for the budget. But so it'll be it'll be reworded in the next iteration. Um, Uh, river hazard regulations, typos, yes, priority, yes, not actionable. Uh, no proposed changes. Were the measurable, were there measurable results from the past flood? Are there downsides to these regulations creating burials? Is there pro forma for FEMA funding? So the typos are fixed, priorities already fixed. Um, continuing to do an action as a strategy. We ensure safe housing by enforcing flood hazard rules. If we do not continue to enforce these rules, then we do not get the benefits provided. At this point, we do not have proposed changes to the rules to add to the plan. Um, this would not be the place to debate the value provided by having the regulations, zero buildings. So the, the proof of the in the pudding, zero buildings that were built to flood codes flooded in July. Only grandfathered, non-conforming structures flooded. Measures that however you like, uh, you can measure that however you like. There may be a cost in order to comply with these regulations, but it's a false narrative to describe whether Montpelier citizens should have either safe or affordable housing. Developers can meet flood codes and keep tenants safe and still make a profit. 
uh, this is not a pro forma strategy. So um, I think that one's fine. And anyone's welcome to jump in and recommend changing. Just trying to make sure we can work our way through. ADA, uh, correct title. The first time home buyer, I believe, has had no measurable impacts. Uh, we can make a correction to the title. Um, Yeah, in any event, the uh, the references to the home buyer program is due to the funding formula that was used. The program was actually measurable and was effective for many years at accomplishing the goals. It was discontinued because the housing committee wanted to focus programs on um, other other items. None of this is actually important to the current program, except to recommend using the same formula for extending money. Uh, disagree with the measurable requirement. We need money available to individuals when they need help. No, no one requests ADA improvements. It's not a failure to the program. It's a failure if we don't have the money available when somebody comes to us and asks for assistance. So, uh, so we used to have an ADA accessibility program, and we had. Can money. you remind me what? Um... Can you read out the item that this comment is about? I think it's the ADA accessibility program. And I think there was a discussion about bringing it back. That was one of our, uh, or one of the strategies. Yeah, we used to have a strategy. We used to have an ADA program. And I think Sean's going to. Ready? Amend the ADA accessibility program. For many years, the city had an ADA revolving loan fund for accessibility projects. It was administratively difficult, rarely used, and now lacks funding. The planning department recommends making a program similar to the former first-time homebuyer program, but new funding will need to be set aside and should match existing programs already provided by an organization such as the Vermont Center for Independent Living. Oh, thank you, Sean. So, yeah, so the idea is the, the first-time homebuyer program, whether we you know, that people can like or dislike it, but it had a very unique, very interesting funding st funding approach. So we would loan people money at a 0% interest and it goes as a mortgage on the property and you don't have to pay it back till you sell your house. That's the way the first time home buyer program worked. Now you can not like the first time home buyer program, but that's irrelevant. We're just taking that funding mechanism, the way that works and use that for accessibility. So if somebody had a building that was not ADA accessible, and they wanted to make it ADA accessible, if we had the funding, we could loan it to them at 0% and put a mortgage on the property. When they sell the property, we can get the money back. Um, we think that would do a lot for us to get the ADA accessibility program back. We had it, the money was all expended. We don't have the money anymore, so the program really doesn't exist, but we'd like to bring it back because it has value. Um, we think it has value in making buildings more accessible. Um, and- uh, And is this specifically for housing? It It's not, in this case, it's specifically, I mean, we're talking about it in the context of housing. The ADA accessibility program actually worked for, for any, any property could come in and access money for accessibility, whether it was, it could be a commercial business, could be could be a residential, could be a, a um, an apartment building, but any of them could get access to the funding. Um, and so it's a, just a different. It's a we just want to get it so that way it would um, get the get the money back and get that program moving again in a positive direction. Um, it fell away. We don't really have any other way of helping people do these accessibility projects, but we need a partner and we just need to get some money back into those funds again. And Peter? Um, I'm certainly in favor of the ADA program. I think, Mike, your characterization, you're, you're linking it to the uh, first time buyer program is full of baloney. It was not a successful program and it did not use an organization like VCIL, which would be great. It was managed by your someone in your office 
and it did not work. And the reason why we never got money paid back, almost never got money paid back. It helped people who happen to know. Peter, that's not Peter. That is not true. Can so, we, it is can we just say, and it's, and it's not relevant. It's not relevant to this this one, anyways. It's yeah. it, we. I know the money got paid back because I watched the checks come back. And it's and so I know these things happened. Can we just use the language zero percent deferred instead of referring to the home ownership program if that's a trigger for some people? I, I forget. Sorry, if I don't have that in front of me, but I just yep, I'll, to I'll, yeah, and I can try to reword that. Oh. Working in Excel. Uh, Uh, change reference to the first time home buyer program to describe model. Uh, or we'll call it funding formula. I'll know what that means. Um, Yes. So the comment on fair housing assessments, uh, yes, fair housing assessments are a thing. There are actually two types of things. There are fair housing assessments, and then there's another housing assessment that's out there. Um, so these are usually done by regional folks like Downstreet. Um, and... Then we pay extra for Montpelier specific information. So fair housing assessments uh, typically would go through and try to look at um, how they're advertised. Sometimes if you are in a Burlington area, they might go through and do test cases. So they'll go through and put in applications. You know, they might um, have a, a name that sounds like uh, somebody who's a minority. So um, and put in those applications and see if you get approved or denied. And then you'd put it in with a, you know, with a Mike Miller and see if it gets approved or denied. And it would be a violation of fair housing to see that, you know, all the Mike Millers and, and Dan Jones and Peter Kelman's all get um, housing, but all the, uh, you know, uh, Rosados, Hernandez and everybody else does not, then that, those are violations. Those are what those fair housing assessments do. Um, so usually, and that's one aspect of, there's a lot of aspects. So there are regional fair housing assessments are a thing. They are done periodically. We don't do them. We usually partner with, with our housing partners who have a requirement to do them. And then because they're doing it regionally, we want to know how are we doing in Montpelier? So we pay extra money. So that's what the strategy is about. Um, but it looks like, uh, we could do some rewording for clarity. Uh, housing trust fund. Believe, uh, believe funds to complaints about spending money. So, uh, the, yeah, I mean, some of these just misunderstandings, uh, the which we've tried to clarify with the housing committee. There, there haven't been a bunch of first-time homebuyer funds that have accumulated because it's tied to a program. Downstreet ran the first-time homebuyer program. That was their program. They came in and they requested sixty thousand dollars, and it took them like five years to expend all the money. So it wasn't they were getting $60,000 every year to do the program. They got $60,000 one year. So they, there wasn't a bunch of money accumulating. Um, there is money in the in the housing trust fund that has been accumulating. Um, I believe they have more than $200,000 right now. Um, it hadn't reached zero until this year. I think this year is actually zero. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um Housing task force reference does need updating. So yeah, I think there's going to be some clarifications, but I don't think for the most part.
there are any real changes I would suggest making. It references the committee because the planning department does not make formal recommendations on the spending of that money. Uh, I think the new, the new um, formula, the, the new housing trust fund guidelines actually does have the planning commission make ref, make recommendations, a separate recommendation from the housing committee. So, but that's what the new, the new guidelines that were passed this year. So we'll review again for clarity on that one. Fair housing policy, correction to housing committee believes it pro formula. That's been fixed. So we're looking for a policy. So this is this this is um We are required to because we get AC, we get the the HUD money to fur, uh, further fair housing, affirmatively further fair housing, and we've always wanted to have a formal statement uh, get adopted by councils on that, and that's why um, there isn't one out there. We would be the first in the state. We think it would be good to have it. We haven't done it yet. We're hoping, hoping to do that. And it certainly certainly wouldn't be I believe something that would be just a pro forma. Um, I think it would actually be a statement that has has some strength behind it. Uh, all right, and then we're back to suggest these. Go back to the original three that were suggested. Um, again, we could pull those back up. I think we've been through all the original aspirations. You know, the first three aspirations were the three I actually suggested back in 2018. So I always liked those, but, but these have gone through a lot of process and discussion. And that's where we got to specific to be does not address current shortcomings of social and economic justice, no recommendations provided. So I don't think there's much to change there. What sort of mix examples of types and appropriate mix? I think we've gone through this a little bit. Um, we were talking about examples of types and appropriate mix. This was goes back to one of the goals. Um, the commission wanted to shorten the goals and combine them. This was a decision that was a part of the commission. I think we've gone through the goals a couple times now um, and we'll, redo them we'll put them back out and we'll have another bite at the apple um when we've got the revised wording all done suggest to increase the number of dwelling units that meet appropriately requires universal accessibility we kind of talked about that one already that was talked about already want to support more broadly applies to all housing not just one product yet yeah, we just talked about that one that's good those are included in number seven. Need to add recreation center project, emergency housing to implement the strategy. Uh, agreed. I'm going to come up with language for that. So currently there's a proposal, a proposed project for the rec center to be renovated into emergency housing. And that's not, it's an actual project. It's not on our implementation plan. It should be. Suggest to expand housing for all goal to include housing first model for those experience homelessness agreed assuming this is part uh this is the policy of the council staff will develop the language so if you guys are good with that i'll try to fit that in um adopt the policy of housing first um so we'll put a policy in the strategy section for a policy of housing first um, which I'll have to get some details from folks, uh, the homelessness folks, on what that means and what they want it to say. Um, but it's a policy, um, so we'll have to see how that gets worded. Uh, but that would be a policy recommendation that, if you want, I can put together and put in. 
need a project to identify the location and build low barrier housing could be tied to the rec building on number 80. So anyone have thoughts on those four that are in there? If we, you don't want me to do something. My thought was in the public comment, I thought those were pretty, pretty good comments. As the city plan plans for a variety of housing, that affordable housing should be the highest and first priority. And I think we've talked about this a little bit. We kind of went back and forth and round and round. Not sure if that needs a change in the storyboard or implementation plan. Um, and I think we had a little bit, we weren't sure if that was actually where it was going to go. And so, so. so I'll, I'll just throw out there. I mean, if you don't know about housing first, it's a, there's a, it's, it means a lot. And I don't know that we all really understand what that means. Mike, I know you do. Peter does. There's probably others that do, but uh, what are we really committing to? It's, it's one thing to, you know, sort of philosophically say, Hey, we, we've got a goal of housing first, but I, I'm not sure really what we're signing up to. My only comment, I, I don't know that we can do that in a, a quick, like, I think we would need an education before I could support a goal like that. I mean, other others could, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that housing first requires and relies upon robust social services. So I wonder if it's, uh, I don't know. I, I support housing first, but I think it's, it. I, Gabe is, that's a good point that it it is a, um, <laughs> there's a lot to it <laughs> um, would, we, would we want to go with a us um we could go with a study or a plan we can go through of, of recommending that there's a study to investigate I, whether I we think that would it. be a great goal because i yeah i think more awareness of the housing first model would be would be tremendous for yeah i support city. that but that'd be great like, and what are the gaps that would help, you know, what are the things that we need to get there? So, you know, what is the cost? What's the implementation? What's the staffing resources? Uh, so when it comes to, I think there was the, this was a separate discussion here, the one on a variety of, um, housing that housing should be the, the, the highest and first priority. I don't, I don't necessarily know if that was tied to the homelessness or just housing is the number one issue in town, whether it's homelessness or not. And therefore that should be the highest priority, um, but I think we've had a lot of conversations. There's a lot of a lot of things that are important right now. Uh, Priorities, yeah. SROs. Our plan discusses supporting a variety of housing and SROs and congregate living are part of that variety. We also allow these all types of zonings. No matter what else we would, uh, what else would be needed in the plan to to discuss this, but we basically already have that as a requirement. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually think the SROs is really important, um, but I don't have anything suggested. So I wonder, is it, is it possible that I could think about suggesting some language and come back to this? I know we're eager to try to wrap up the housing piece, but um. I do think it's a it's a really unique type of housing that neither the market nor right or nor downstreet develops. <laughs> but yeah, I do think it I do think it's really needed. At least some. And we don't really have any. Yeah, it, it provides it certainly provides the 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 lowest barrier to getting people housed. I mean think of think of an SRO, you know as yeah, and I, I think it offers a model of like a way to to kind of manage um, difficult or challenging populations. That's yeah. Anyway, 
Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'll yeah, we we'll have to see where where we can plug in a discussion of that of that type of you know, even if it's just plugged in as an example, such as SROs and of course we'll have to explain single room occupancies people. So we need to be uh, focus on housing stability, including services. This again goes to to the homelessness. I think this is getting a little bit into overlap area. You know, we've got a housing plan, we've got a community services plan. So we kind of get ourselves into that mix of not sure where that would kind of come into the conversation unless we have a specific section that comes up in and as homelessness in the housing storyboard. Incentivize conversion of offices into house into housing units. Uh, these types of projects are allowed already. Not sure what incentives could be provided. There's a lot of tools I can there there aren't a lot of tools I can think of. Um It's similar to like an ADA conversion, right? Or like a, some incentive for to do the project. I mean, I would think that the incentive to do the project would be that the market for offices yeah, is they'd, they'd greater. Be removing, they'd be removing a vacant office space and replacing it with an occupied housing space. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I've seen that the incentive is needed. Most of the time it's just a lot of the ones that don't are people that don't want to deal with rentals. Um, rentals have a lot of issues that come with them from management. So there are a number of people who are commercial landlords who will not convert to residential simply because they don't want to deal with the people and they don't want to deal with the rules. You don't pay your rent as a commercial tenant on the first of the month, your locks are changed. Um, and if renters don't pay it, then you're in a position where you've got to use legal means to get people moved. So, and some landlords simply don't want to deal with that. Um, a recommendation for projects to come into compliance with zoning, we're dealing with exterior lighting on housing, energy, and transportation and utilities. So it's a strange comment to get during the housing chapter, but we did. Due to state law, we cannot require that. So there's real no change there. Uh, perhaps we could add a policy on transportation chapter about streetlight quality that would... Oh, someone's talking about using the lights. So it could be used... transportation but you know again we've got the transportation i'm not sure we really want to you're welcome to get into discussing the quality of our street lighting um but again i think this bottom one sums it up that's policy decision but i don't think it's identified as a significant issue by the public or council to warrant placing in a strategic plan for our exterior lighting impacts great so does that is that the last of the historic preservation and housing Yes. Great. Um, Woo, made it through. Great. Okay. And I will, I will get to that SRO within the next week or, um, and send something to you. Um, but that's great. Cause I want to, I want to make sure we have at least some time for, um, the item that Maria suggested. Maria had a couple items. Maria, do you want to kick us off? Um, well, I think first, I thought it'd be useful to go through um, the state authorizing statute for planning commissions and review what our responsibilities and roles are. Um, I haven't, I haven't seen the planning commission do this since I started two years ago. So I thought it should be a, I don't know, a good reminder. All right. Yeah, that's great. Do you have it to pull up, Mike? Yep. I was just 
moving Great. it over into the right spot so I can, when I share my screen, it's actually there. All right. So hopefully everybody can see this. So this is under state law. The powers and duties of the planning commission. And the key thing under this is any planning commission created under this chapter may do any of these things. You're not required to do anything under here. Um, but these are the things they, when the legislature created planning commissions many, many years ago, that they kind of envisioned that they would be working on um, plans and amendments thereof for consideration by the legislative body. Um as set forth in subchapter five, which I believe is the the plans that we're doing right now. So prepare plans and amendments for your municipal plans. Uh, next duty was uh, to prepare bylaws. So these are the things you kind of expect. Planning commissions are gonna make plans and the city plans that are gonna get adopted. We're gonna do the, uh, the bylaws and they're gonna get adopted. Administer bylaws under this chapter, except to the extent they are performed by Development Review Board. So up until 2002, the Planning Commission used to have on their agenda reviews of projects. After 2002, I think it was, the city adopted a Development Review Board, and all of your Development Review responsibilities have been taken over by the DRB. So you don't have to worry about number three. Uh, undertaking capacity studies, land use stuff. There's a lot of stuff. We've done this on a number of times. We did this, the streetscape master plan. Um, so there's a lot of little things that we can do um, that aren't necessarily these big city plans, but are these smaller plans that can be undertaken to basically accomplish the various goals that we have um, that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we can prepare and present codes we want to see code improvements so really we the planning commission has a lot of flexibility to bring recommendations to the city council on anything that we feel could help implement the city plan um, we do have building we don't have plumbing we do have fire codes we don't have electrical we don't have housing um, One that kind of comes up that uh, I very rarely seen communities actually do is to the the planning commission can prepare the capital budget and program for a period of up to five years. Now, in a smaller town, I've seen a few of them that kind of considered this because you sometimes need to have this capital budget and program if you want to do impact fees. So you can kind of, but for the most part, on a community of our scale, um, the people that develop our capital budget and program are the, the Department of Public Works and the fire chief and the police chief and everybody who's got a capital item because our, our items are so big. But in a small community where everybody's a volunteer, sometimes the planning commissions will take over our capital budget, but not too often. Um, you can hold public meetings, uh, require from other departments and agencies and um municipalities information related to the work of the planning commission so you can request more information from other groups or um, if we're doing transportation plan we could request the public works director not sure why these some of these have to be in here but gives you the power they they, they gave you the power to do these perform functions enter upon land to make examinations and surveys in the performance of your functions I would love to get the attorney's opinions on number nine. Not sure how much that actually comes into, into legal issues. Um, but maybe if you're doing a historic survey, your ability to walk onto the land for the most part, we tend to go and not enter people's lands without uh, permission or without uh, a court's authorization. Um, and maybe because nowadays we do so much with remote sensing, we just do is we, we can't walk on your property, but we could get an aerial photograph and get a pretty good look at your property. Participate in regional programs, retain staff and consultants assistance. Um, so usually that's, we have staff here. If you were in 
Woodbury. Um, it just gives the planning commission the ability to hire a consultant to help write their city plan. Under to undertake comprehensive study uh, planning and related planning and engineering studies and to perform, perform other acts or functions as it may deem necessary or appropriate to fulfill the duties and obligations imposed by and the intent of and purposes of this chapter. So if when all else fails, you just go number 13 on something. It's pretty broad. Um, so yeah, really for the most part, again, they give broad authorization under um, under the powers and duties. But once you do something, it usually kicks you into something else. So you want to do a plan. Now you're kicked into the 4380s and you have to meet all those requirements. It's an option. But once you choose to do that option, then you meet the, then you fall into the requirements. Um, has the Montpelier Planning Commission ever done like capacity studies about any of those topics? Or is it usually the yeah, you know, like historic and scenic preservation? I assume the historic resources committee is actually doing that. Yeah, a lot of because we have so many committees. I think 23 of them at last count. There's usually a committee that's doing, you know, a transportation committee doing the transportation work and the energy committee doing the energy work. A lot less of this has fallen onto the planning commission. So in obviously in the 10 years I've been here, the first five years predominantly were spent writing the zoning regulations. Mm. And the next five years we're amending the zoning regulations and trying to get the, the, this city plan moved to a point where it's getting ready for review and adoption. Um, but once it's adopted, we've got the flexibility to either work with another board or if there's something specific that comes up, we can do the work ourselves. If nobody else is going to take up the work, then we can do it ourselves to, to do a capacity study on certain issues. Okay. Well, thanks for going through that, Mike. Yeah. Um. And then my other questions were, there seems to be a lot of development work, work happening around the city. Um, the city council is trying to sell that parcel of land for 440000 Yep. Yep. Um, do you know anything about? So that was, um, that piece of land was, the 1216 Main Street was acquired as a part of the bike path project. So yeah. when the bike path went through, there were three separate parcels, one that was the m, &M Beverage, one that was the Association for the Blind building in back, and then there was the TKS, which was a vacant lot mm -hmm. um, that really was just used for parking. And so we acquired all three of them. Um, initially, the M&M Beverage was going to be part of a project. They were going to build a new building. So we're going to tear down that building. We're going to build a new building, and M&M Beverage was going to move into that first floor of that building, and the upper two floors were going to be... I think they're going to be offices actually. Um, at the last second, that deal fell apart. Um, so we just bought all parcels and we've just sat on the vacant lot. Council wanted to go and get that um, sold. So uh, we put that, that's why it's on the market is because council had requested that we put the RFP together to see if there was interest in the private folks in developing it. Um, and so I believe the, I think, the RFP isn't out. It's going out very, very soon. Um, and then we'll start to see what we get for replies back. Maybe it's going to be housing. Um, but really, we've tried to keep it as open as possible to to see who shows up and offers what for the property. Okay. I'd be curious to see what happens. Um, and then... <laughs> um, I think it was the, like an auto mechanic that was demolished on on berlin street on berlin street yep so um, the the dunkin donuts purchased it <laughs> and they're <poor> town. <laughs> yep they're the ones because it, basically if, if you're familiar with the dunkin donuts over on berlin over in berlin um past the price chopper they they purchased a property next to themselves to have a longer queuing so there wasn't oh. as many queuing problems into the street and our dunkin donuts has had um, a lot of issues sometimes with 
with the the queuing line actually backing up into the road. So by buying the property next to them, they're going to be able to move their entrances down so they can better have people get in and out of their site. Um, so, um, so my question, so I'm curious about what hoops, if any, Dunkin' Donuts had to go through to demolish a building and just basically extend what used to be a useful lot into parking. So it's all of these end up being um, complicated to answer because it depends on where you are in the city and it depends on what the building is. That building is not on the National Register and therefore it does not have to get a special hearing to demolish it. Right. So it becomes just yeah. a matter of we have two types of permits. So for everyone to kind of understand, we've got two big buckets of permits. Our one big bucket of permit are what we call administrative permits. And those are ones where you can come in and if you meet all the requirements, I want to put a porch on, I want to build a garage, I want to build a house. There are administrative permits. You come in, we look at the things, you meet the rules. Yes, here's your permit. You can walk out the door. Not quite that fast, but usually within 24 hours, we turn around those administrative permits. Um, some of them may have an administrative site plan that may take a little bit longer if it's a commercial project, but all these administrative permits are all ones that we, we, my staff can issue. Um, we have the powers to issue others, uh, require hearings, uh, and those have to be warned. They have to have public notice, uh, butters get noticed. So those are, those are a different class. So usually we have, um, and on average, in a year, we'll do about 140 permits for zoning every year. And right now, between 15 and 20 will require a hearing. So mm -hmm. not very many. And some of them may require just a DRC. Some of them require a DRV. So DRC is your design review. So if you're in the design review district, I don't know if this project was or wasn't. It's really close. I actually don't know if it is in design review. If it was, it would have to have gone to DRC. The design review committee would have looked at it to ensure that it would not negatively impact historic structures um, in any direction and that it would meet certain aesthetic requirements. If it wasn't the DRC, it's really kind of close. I'm not sure if it is or isn't. Um, others, um, so that's your, your, there's a map for a design review district if you're in it then you're going to have to go through that. And if you're not, then you don't. The DRB is increasingly, every time we do a zoning amendment, we've been removing those requirements. We'll go through and say, well, this isn't going to be a conditional use anymore. This is going to be um, a permitted use. Well, the permitted uses are those administrative. So the conditional uses are fewer and fewer of them. Um, subdivisions required by law. Uh, we can't make those administrative. We can make some of them. Uh, have hearings. So some of our hearings are for subdivisions and some of them are for uh, larger projects or where people need a waiver, which I think we talked about a little bit earlier. So we have all these administrative rules, which means if you meet the rule, you can get us, you know, um, you got a 10 foot setback. Everybody on your street has a 10 foot setback. So we've got that 90% rule. Everybody's got a 10 foot setback. You've got a 10 foot setback. And then you come in and say, I really want to be eight feet and mm -hmm. here's my reason. Well, you can get that eight foot or you can, everybody's required to have one parking space per dwelling unit and you've got a five unit building, but you only want to have four parking spaces. And you're like, yeah, but I'm on the bus route or I'm here. It's like, well, that's great, but yeah. we need to, you, you want an exception to the rule. We can give you an exception to the rule, but you have to go to the board. We have to notify your neighbors that goes and says, hey, we're giving him an exempt him or her an exemption to the rule. What do you think about that? Um, and so that's that's where these hearings come in. I don't know for this specific project whether it triggered or needed to go through a, a, a hearing or not. Um, I I I have staff that are very good at their jobs. And so they only when they have questions do I kind of get in on something because there's a wording that isn't quite there or uh, some subtle details, they'll ask me my opinion. But I, I didn't hear anything on this one. So I think it was a pretty straightforward project. Uh, 
So if someone had bought that property and wanted to build a four-story apartment building, like how, what hoops would they have had to go through then? Uh, so if it was, I don't think it's in design review. So let's go and say it's not in design review. Right. So it's a four unit building. We would look at the chart and go through and say that that building is in mixed use uh, or it's it's in um, the one that Barry Street is in. <laughs> so, which is basically a mixed use residential uh, riverfront district. Mm -hmm. That section is in riverfront. So riverfront, that would be four unit building would be a permitted use. So we would have to see the plans for the permitted use as to what's getting built. We would uh, review all the setbacks, all the parking requirements, whatever would be required in there. And uh, if it's in design review, we would have to get some drawings of what it would look like for design review. If it's not, then we would just review, make sure it meets all the parking um, and all those requirements and probably get an administrative site plan because it's more than two units, it would need a site plan. Have an administrative site plan would probably be approved within a couple of days uh, if they didn't need any waivers. Right. So it, that also wouldn't have to go to a hearing or any. Probably more wouldn't need a hearing un unless it needed unless it needed a waiver. Unless they unless they wanted an exception to one of the rules, um, it probably would not need to to go through that. There. Occasionally things, I'm trying to think, there, there are some strange ones that pop up depending on the size of the building. Um, That's why I said four-story. Yeah, four-story. The height doesn't actually matter. The funny thing about it is more of the footprint. Mm -hmm. There's like a, if it's more than 2,000 square foot footprint, then it becomes a major site plan. And the major site plan then has to go to the DRB. So, so it, like if a ground, if one floor of this four-story apartment building was larger than 2,000 square feet, then it would have to go to the DRB? Probably. Okay. Yeah, there's some some rules on, on how big a building gets. It would then kick it into, as we said, that there's certain architectural requirements that get kicked in when you're building large buildings. So, and I think the arbitrary line that was in the sand was put in at 2,000 square feet. So if your footprint was bigger than 2,000 square feet, then you'd have to go and do a major site plan, which kicked you into some architectural rules that you'd have to meet, those types of things. Uh, but again, the best thing we always go and tell people, if, if you need, if you have ideas, just to go and meet with um, Meredith or Nick now to kind of work through the questions, because they'll go through and, and give you the things. You're not going to spring it on you. They'll always go and tell you, well, if you keep it, they'll tell you if, if you keep it under 2000 square feet, then you won't have to go through this process. If you're more than 2000, then you'll have to go through this other process and they'll keep you on the straight and narrow to. Okay. Know. I was just curious whether in our city code, it's easier just to demolish and create a parking lot than it is to create new housing. <laughs> I'm like, uh, the, which one do we actually want as a community? You know? Sometimes it depends what, and sometimes, again, you can play with the rules. Uh, rules are written and we have to follow the rules. So sometimes it's like, well, you can't have just a parking lot. So if you buy that parcel and you merge it with your existing parcel, then it's not just a parking lot. It's a parking lot that's a part of right. Dunkin' Donuts. And so they were the only ones who could have purchased it and made it into a parking lot. <laughs> into a parking lot. <laughs> right. Correct. They're the only ones who probably could have played and made that made that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, they're, 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 people are going to do things and things happen from time to time. Um, you know, we still have a parking lot on on State Street um, when uh, at the corner of Governor Davis, I, they tore down the old gas station that was there to do a reconstruction project. And then everything fell apart on the project. So it was contingent, <laughs> contingent on building a parking garage. The parking garage right. got killed. It took six, you know, whatever, four, four years to figure out that the parking garage was killed. And by the time that happened, the redesign project was going to be a bank. The bank actually ended up then being in the building next door in the historic building. So every time this project comes up to remove that parking lot, that technically shouldn't be there, but Technically, they keep trying to build it and everything yeah. keeps falling apart. So not for lack of effort to get something built there. Um, so we'll see. 
but there, there are things that do happen where you end up. <laughs> Sean is just sitting here shaking his head. <laughs> it, was, it was a project that has been doomed for, for so long. I love I I walk past that parking lot all the time and it drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah, for years it was caught up in the litigation for the parking garage because the, the project that was proposed for that location was contingent on the parking garage getting built. Mm -hmm. And the assumption was it was just imminent and then it just imminently never happened. Until right. it finally died and then there was a bank proposal that came in next. That then ended up being taken by the building next door. It's a different developer. I always assumed that that lot on the corner was owned by the state since it's got state parking in nope. it right now. That is is private. It's a privately owned lot. Okay. Yep. And when the the situation came up, they didn't want to make it a public parking lot because they didn't. It was it was already an issue that it was a parking lot there, so mm -hmm. they leased it to the state. Why don't any of the developers? in Montpelier develop their properties. Okay. Different. <laughs> that was a definite let's, let's not go into that right now, but that is on my mind. <laughs> um, well, I think that was really interesting. I sort of wish we got to that earlier, but um, I am aware that it's 735, so I wonder if we can yeah. Table the minutes and the other item. Maria, are you okay? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, although I think that one is really important too. And hopefully, I mean, we can still have a chance to discuss that, I think, briefly at the beginning of the public input process, maybe, or at the end. Oh, uh, is our, our next meeting is a public input meeting? Yeah, the next meeting is going to be a public input meeting. Okay. So. I was actually Ariane, going to invite people to come speak to that topic because um, I've just I've heard so many children are getting harassed and I think it's a huge issue. Um, and so I was hoping that we could have actually some parents and kids here to discuss what they've been through. Um, I mean, I I think this is a really really important issue, but I don't. Do you feel like? another committee would be i'm not sure who but because i don't know i mean we can't <laughs> we can't address it through zoning i don't think i mean i guess we could address it in the city plan but so there i think it, for i think it's a planning issue um and i think it could be improved through planning and not law enforcement or some other mechanism so that's that's kind of why i thought our commission might be able to brainstorm a solution that's not calling the cops oh okay um it could be could be something that we do have a complete streets committee um they might have stuff i was going to say if we did have that as a topic I, I i would imagine that the police chief or somebody else would want to be involved at least to kind of hear and to guide the conversations on where where it's appropriate and not appropriate to to bring in um, and have the police um, have have them as a part. They have to be a part of the conversation because when we're talking about safety, um, yeah. there are times where things are unsafe that you know we do need to make sure that they are brought in. Um, you know, we do have this public safety chapter that we pretty much just let them write and sort of adopted i mean and if this is an issue i don't know when the right time is but i i think we should hear what's going on yeah i mean i'm also fine postponing the public input and doing both those sessions in october and focusing on public safety i'm also i'm realizing i didn't focus on the date of the next meeting but i'm going to be traveling that day and i'm going to try to zoom in but if my flight gets delayed or something i won't be able to attend the next meeting um i just didn't realize that was <laughs> commission day um so i don't know what do other commissioners think about doing the two public input sessions on in october and we could focus on here's some comments if maria wants to bring some some folks and discuss the issue i'm up for that and then finish the matrix. Maybe we can finish the matrix. Yeah. 
for the for the twenty third. I'm just trying to find my yeah. count. And that will give us more lead time too, I think, for um, promoting it. Okay, so Monday the 23rd would be item 6A and the matrix. Um, and yeah, I wonder if we can have a backup to chair the meeting just in case. Again, I'm like flying that day, so you never know what can happen. <laughs> That's, uh, right. that's me uh, that's my job well yeah i mean i i think we could have someone else facilitate maria if you really i know you you have not been enthused about facilitating i know uh, and i think it's fine okay. to ask someone someone else to volunteer dave like crickets <laughs> <laughs> is it because is it because Mar maria you want to speak to the issue at hand or Oh, I am just not good at moving meetings along. <laughs> oh, I know, I know myself. <laughs> so that is the issue. Can we just ask Mike to do it. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I can. Okay. Ma Mike animated. will just enforce a time limit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and hopefully I'll be able to make it. But again, I'm just in case I'm like stuck somewhere. <laughs> I wanted to have a backup plan. Okay. Um, does anyone want to make a move to adjourn? I do. Moved. <laughs> a second. I had Sean and Gabe. That's whichever one you okay. want to put. So, All right. Go. Uh, for those who want to adjourn, say aye. 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 Thanks, okay, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.